All right. Thank you. Okay, shh. this is a clock right here. I got seven minutes, okay? But I don't even want to pay attention to this because if I got more, I'm going, okay? Now, you know, I'm so excited. I got to tell you just a little bit of a, a personal thing here. I really, truly have been thinking about this idea of the kingdom of God for like the last four years. It's been this thing that God has put in my mind. I cannot run away from it. And it all came one day when I was sitting in church and we we're doing the Lord's Prayer, right? And, you know, I'm, I only have a little bit of time, so I'm jumping right in. So you just have to jump right with me, okay? Do you know that line in the prayer that says, Thy kingdom come? Stop. This particular Sunday, I got to that verse, and I could not say anything more. Because all of a sudden, I realized that Jesus has given to us disciples. Are you a disciple? Really? Right? We say we're disciples. This is a disciple's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All of a sudden, I just had to stop and think, I can't pray this prayer anymore because I don't even understand what the kingdom of God is about. You know, we say the kingdom of God. We say the kingdom of God. We talk about the kingdom of God like we understand what it is, but I don't think we really truly have taken the time to kind of get in the scriptures and look at what God is saying to us about the kingdom of God. Do you realize that Jesus is the very central part of his message and teaching was this thing called the kingdom of God? How do we read the scriptures and get past that? We just kind of breeze on through and we don't really take the time. And so I've kind of made it this, God gave this to me to stop and really kind of dive into this idea of the kingdom of God. And I got to tell you, as much as I love God and as much as I love the scripture, the kingdom of God kind of ticks me off. If it doesn't offend you at some level, then I don't think we're reading really kind of the spirit of... When Jesus was saying this stuff about the kingdom of God, it offended people. Do you realize that? It offended the people that should have known, those following. It offended them. And so I kind of am offering to you tonight this um, request to allow us to offend each other just a little bit. Can we do that? Can we do that? Okay, now is the kingdom. Let's take, um, I'm going to take the first bit of our time here. I told you I was jumping right in, Ephraim. I'm jumping right in, okay? All right. Okay, I want to get the, um, the scripture verse up there. We're talking tonight from Matthew chapter 25. And um, if you have taken some time to look at the book of Matthew, you're going to discover that the central part of this whole book is about teaching disciples. This is, if there is such a thing as a manual, which I don't like to call the scriptures a manual, because that's not what it's meant to be a love story, right? But if you kind of like that manual sort of approach to the scripture, then get into Matthew because it will give you exactly what you need to know about being a disciple. His very core of Matthew's message is about following Jesus from the beginning to the end. If you want to know what, what, to be, you know, what it means to be a disciple, get into Matthew. All the way through, there's stories about the kingdom of God is like this. It's like this. It's like this. It's like this. And in chapter 24, which is right before chapter 25, right? I guess that would be right. 24 is before 25. The disciples are saying, you know, how are we going to know? when the end of the age is. Basically, they're asking the question, how are we going to know when it's time? And so chapter 25 is part of Jesus' answer. We need to know how to ask the right questions. We're so ready to give answers to kids, I don't know that we've sat with the questions. Have you really sat with the questions of the scripture before you talk to kids about what it means? Have you struggled with the questions? Have you struggled with the questions that the scripture raises for yourself before you kind of go out there, before we go out there and try to tell kids what it means? Chapter 25 is part of this answer. And he goes into this story, this parable, about the bridesmaids. You with me? Okay. So Jesus is setting the stage, right? He says the kingdom of God is like this. It's like this wedding, right? And you got bridesmaids. Now, bridesmaids, you know what your job is at a wedding. In this particular culture, the bridesmaids had a, just a very critical role. 
You were the one that was supposed to watch for the groom. When the groom was coming down, you were the one that was supposed to escort the groom to the father of the bride's house where the bride was getting ready and bring the wedding party out. That's your whole job as a bridesmaid. You can assume that the bridesmaids were these people that were close into the family, so there's relationship there, right? So Jesus says it's like this. It's like these bridesmaids. Now think about yourself as a person listening. The kingdom of God is like this. It's like bridesmaids. You got 10 of them. Five were foolish, five were wise. Here comes the groom. Five of them aren't ready. Their oil runs out, right? Now they're tripping because they're going to miss the thing that they're supposed to be about. Listen, this story is about us. This is not a story about your kids who don't know Jesus. This story is about us. We're the bridesmaids. You and I, Jesus is talking to us and saying, this is like you all, you're the bridesmaids, and you know what? There's the potential that half of you are wise and half of you are foolish, and you're going to miss the thing that you're supposed to know and never miss. This is hard for me. Like I said, the parables kind of tick me off sometimes, and I'm really real about that. Because now I'm thinking, I thought I knew. Trust me, we don't always know. And that's why we have to come to the scriptures with the humble, seeking, learning, asking, what does it mean? Jesus says, five foolish, they go off, they miss the groom. He comes back, whoa. He goes, takes the the bridesmaids that have been there, takes them in. They go into the wedding party, and they're kicking it, right? They're starting the celebration. Here come the five foolish thinking they're going to get in when they miss the thing that they were supposed, the only job they had that day. The only job they had that day was to watch and be ready for when he showed up. This is a warning to us. Potentially, as busy as we are, as youth working people as we are, as speakers, as workshop leaders, as ministers, all that stuff potentially could end up in the end, you and I could still be missing it. It doesn't, I'm not saying that what we do isn't important. I'm saying there's something here that Jesus is trying to get us at. Don't miss me. Do not miss me. Watch, be ready, and watch and be ready, and don't miss who I am when I'm coming. You know, it's, it's an honor to be up here with my sister and to talk about this text. These ten bridesmaids, and as Lena laid out, five are foolish. And in this version that I have, it says five were prudent. And, and what this prudent means is that, that five of them were thoughtful. They, they weren't just around waiting for the groom to come they were thoughtful, they were reflective, they were thinking about what it truly means to await the groom, to be ready, to know my calling. Uh, There are some people that are in ministry that may be in it for the wrong reasons. There are some people going to church for the wrong reasons. There are some people that have made Christianity just a bunch of religious jargon and emotionalism, and and it's become a fad. It's become a game. It's become the cool thing to do. It's the t-shirt. It's the conference. It's It's being able to say to your friend how anointed you are, but there were five bridesmaids that were prudent. They they were really meditating on, thinking about what it means to be connected to the groom, what it means to be awaiting the king, what it means to be looking out for the kingdom of God coming right now. This word prudent means thoughtful, but it means discreet. It means I'm not trying to become the next urban youth worker celebrity. I'm not doing this so I'll be popular. I'm not doing this so my picture will be in the next brochure of the next conference. I'm not doing this because I'm going to make a lot of money. Some of the work that we do has to be discreet. It's that some of the work has to just be between us and God in the prayer closet, speaking a language that nobody else can understand but us and God. 
God. Some of the work we do, it's like parents don't understand it. The pastor though might not understand it, but God is calling us to walk with kids in a way that is prudent, that is thoughtful, that has integrity, that has purpose, that's been prayed. I don't just pull messages to kids out your butt is what I'm trying to say. It ought to be thoughtful what you say to this generation of young people. Are you putting thought into what you're preaching and saying and teaching? I, I'm, I'm trying not to preach, Lena. I'm trying to hit this thing, but, but prudent, discreet, practical is what you're doing with kids. Sometimes you need to do some things with kids that are practical, like help them graduate. Practical. Help them honor their mother. See, see, sometimes we're so busy trying to do something amazing, something out of the box, something on the edge, that sometimes kids just need something practical, like shut your mouth. I'm tired of seeing your draw. Something practical. What in the world you doing with pants that say bootylicious on? Sometimes kids need practical. Wise, wise, are you living a wise ministry life? Are you staying out too late? Are you taking care of your body? Are you loving your wife, your husband? Are, are you loving your husband or are you smelling the cologne of the other volunteer? wise have you put the youth ministry kids between your own children that live with you are you wise and, and so that's what it means to await the king to await the groom it means to be prudent but there was one other thing they were prudent but they also the five that were prudent they had oil to light the lamp Jesus, I think, earlier in Matthew talks about being light and salt. He, he talks about being light. He talks about being salt. And, 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 and he talks about lamps. This is not the first time that Jesus talked about a lamp. But it is the first time that he connects oil to the lamp. So Jesus has already, in other teachings, in this gospel, solidified that our job as urban youth workers is to be lamps, to be light, to be light in darkness, to be light in demonic forces, to be light in the midst of the storm, to be light in the midst of the rain, to be light in pain, to be light in the midst of thoughts of suicide, in the middle of gangbang and in the middle of people getting high and cutting themselves, in the midst of racial segregation, in the midst of institutions that no longer work for our kids and our communities, are you willing to be light when the gospel is not popular, when people are rewriting scripture, when people are creating foolish doctrines? Are you willing to still be light? Now, in order to be light, you need oil. I got to talk about what the oil is. And then I'm going to give it back to my sister. I, I wonder, I'm, I'm wondering, because I don't want to stand up here like I got all the answers, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's a connection between oil and the Holy Spirit. Oil and the Holy Ghost. Is there a connection between in order for me to light up, I need some oil on the inside of me. I know that you've probably heard sermons about external oil, like oil being poured upon people to anoint them. Kings were anointed with oil. Priests, people consecrated and set apart for works of service by oil. But that anointing is only symbolic of the burning oil that is supposed to be on the inside of you through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The oil is your power source. It's your identity. It's your intimacy. 
It's your purpose. It's your discernment. It's your direction. It's your guidance. And it would be foolish to be waiting for the king without oil. It would be foolish to preach to kids with no oil. Some of us in here are trying to preach. We're trying to teach. We're trying to drive the van. We're trying to come up with ideas for youth ministry. And you ain't got no oil. How in the world are you going to minister to this generation and you, some of you got oil, but you need an oil change. I have a friend named Dean. Dean was driving his car one day and it starts smoking and start making crazy noises. Next thing you know, I'm talking about on an interstate, he had to pull over. And when he lifted up the hood, it smelled burnt, dirty, nasty. And, and, and he was trying to figure out what was wrong with his car. So he called for a tow truck. Tow truck came, towed his car to the nearest service station. I don't even need all my time on the clock, sister. I'm about to give it to you in a minute. The man at the service station asked Dean, when's the last time you had an oil change? He said, what's that? Some of y'all in here, you're burnt out tonight. You're burning. There's a stench of tiredness and anger and resentment. You feel like throwing in the towel. What I'm asking you to do is get to the nearest service station. <laughs> get to the nearest pit stop. You need to get in a, some of y'all, you don't need to go to a workshop tomorrow. You need to get into a prayer closet and you need to get to the nearest service station and allow God, Jehovah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Alpha and Omega, Prince of Peace, Rose of Sharon, somebody in here needs God to change your oil. Anybody offended yet? Anybody offended yet? Did anybody offended? Listen, Ephraim said something about intimacy there, right? The Holy Spirit indwelling. Do you know what is really surprising to me about this passage? After all that, right? Jesus does this. Now this, check this, right? Jesus could have ended the parable with, he's going in to the house with the five wise ones and the other ones are left out. Have you ever asked why does Jesus kind of go and say what he, what he says? I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but the very last thing that Jesus says towards the end of this parable is this. To those who were foolish without oil. And if we're going to, if we're going to uh, take what Ephraim just said and oil being the Holy Spirit within us and our intimacy with God. Do you know what Jesus says? I don't know you. What? You don't know me. I've been with you all these years. I've been serving you. I've been loving kids. I've been leading kids to you. I've spent all this time working for you. And to hear, I don't ever, God, please, I don't want to hear those words. I don't want to hear those words. I don't want to hear those words, God. I don't want to hear those words. When I get there, I want you to say, I know you. Not because of all the things that you did, but because I lived in you. How many of us here tonight need to hear this message? Come on. Come on. Larry and his team messed around and decided that they wanted to do this thing on the kingdom of God. I don't know if we've all realized what we're unlocking here this week. This in preparation for this time, my heart was just so burdened because at the same time that I'm so excited because I believe that people are not talking about the kingdom of God and that's why things are jacked up. 
We don't talk about the kingdom of God. We don't preach Jesus. We don't preach Jesus. Jesus says, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. What's he talking about? The kingdom of God is him. Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is at hand. I'm here. You want to know what the kingdom of God is about? Look at Jesus. How many of you spend time looking at Jesus and his life rather than preaching things at kids about the way they behave? Come on, let's be honest. We want to sit up there and talk about don't drink. Are you smoking? Are you dancing? What music are you listening to? We want to manage behavior. We don't want to preach Jesus. We want to manage their behavior, make them act right so they look like they're Christians when we haven't taught them about Jesus. We want to invite kids to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then we leave them there and we don't tell them what Jesus is about. What? What? Do you love Jesus? Really, seriously, if we were to take this poll, me included, and say, how well do I know Jesus? Who did you give your life to? We gave our lives to Jesus to know him. Some of us. I got saved when I was eight years old. And no lie, and I have done this too, and so have you, accepted Jesus because I didn't want to go to hell. You could walk out this place right now, and you don't know what's going to happen. You might get shot. You might get run down by a car. We're trying to scare kids into the kingdom of heaven. We're trying to scare kids into a relationship with this Jesus, right? That's manipulation, y'all. Scaring kids and making them do things because they're afraid is manipulation. That is not love, and that is not preaching the kingdom of God. I want to know, God, I want to know who is preaching Jesus. The kingdom of God is at hand, and it's him. <laughs> you know, Jesus taught a lot about the kingdom of God, but he showed them. <laughs> he taught a lot about the kingdom of God, but he showed them. He showed him by where he hung out. He showed him by what he valued. Are we consistent with that way of proclaiming the kingdom of God, pointing kids to Jesus? Come on. We want to make kids memorize scripture. They don't even have a relationship with Jesus. What, what are we doing? We're creating a generation of young people. This is why I think kids are walking away. We are not presenting a compelling enough image and vision of Jesus for kids to give their life to him, and that's why it's not happening. And you know what? That's on me, and that's on all of us. Our main job is to know Jesus. Not just to know what he said and write the list of the things that are the right things to do and the wrong things to do, but to know him. And I'm telling you, when we know him, we're going to be offended because he's going to call us to things that we're not going to want to hear. You and I are predispositioned to orchestrate a kingdom of God for us that benefits us. You and I are it's just our sinful nature. Let's just call it what it is. We read the scripture through a lens that says, how do I win? How do I win in this? God, how can it be me and yours kingdom? I don't think so. I don't think that God is willing to share that. He's God. But it takes some reflection. It takes prudent, discipline, and reflecting on what does this thing say and not being so fast to go out there and telling kids what it says when we haven't really thought about it for ourselves. And I oftentimes talk to Larry. Larry and I have had conversations about the conference. And my greatest encouragement about this conference is this. Great workshops I love what Ephraim said. Man, if you need to not go to a workshop, don't. Get somewhere and pray. Get with somebody. Do some confession. That, that song that we were sing, singing about being free, are you free? Are you free? If you're not free, 
If that song convicted you, don't leave here and not be free. Right? Don't leave here and not be free. And if you're afraid to talk to somebody about what's got you bound like that, talk, find somebody. Find Ephraim. Find, I don't know who you need to talk to, but I was really thinking while I was sitting over there tonight, some people are not free. And that makes us afraid to advance the kingdom because we might get found out. You know what? If that's you, I just want you to know be free. Be free so that you can know who he is. And that is not a condemning thing. I'm just feeling impressed to encourage you to please not minister and be bound. Be free. The conference, I love because of that idea of bringing all of us together. But the temptation I want to talk to you about tonight. This right here is beautiful, but this is not it. <laughs> this is not it. This is a picture. It's a glimpse. But this is not it. It's a glimpse of what can be. Don't be tempted to go back and think that you were here and that was, and then try to go recreate this back in your youth group. <laughs> you know, we can have a stage and we can have some funny people, right? Don't resist the temptation of trying to be off this path of the kingdom because the kingdom is not about something that's big. If you look at some of the other parables, the kingdom is discreet. It's hidden. The Holy Spirit, let's talk about that. The Holy Spirit hovers, right? Genesis, the Holy Spirit hovers, and where does it hover? Over the darkness and in chaos. <laughs> where does the Holy Spirit hover? Chaos. You and me, we want to run from chaos. We want to orchestrate our life. I'm saying run to the chaos. Run to the chaos in your neighborhood and run to the chaos that's in here because the Holy Spirit is hovering. The Holy Spirit is hovering. The kingdom of God in this parable, as he suggests, is this. And I want to get back to this idea of Jesus standing at the door and saying, I don't know you. Praise the Lord. The grace in this story is that it hasn't happened yet. Oh, thank you, God. The grace in these warnings for you and for me is that it hasn't happened yet. So that you and I can sit in a place like this and ask the hard question, am I foolish or am I wise? Who are you in this story? Am I foolish or am I wise? And for me, I don't ever, my prayer has been in these last few days as I've been preparing for this, is God, just help me to know that you will not say those words to me. I don't know you. I don't want to be about all this, the ministry, the worship, the teaching, the speaking, the mentoring, the coaching, the reaching out, the reaching out to the lost. The, I don't want to be about all that. And at the end, have you say, who are you? You never knew me. I never knew you. The parable that follows this, interestingly enough, is same thing, the talents. Do you know about that? People were, some were given 10, 5, and 1 talent. The one, does everybody know that story? Because I don't have time to go into it, right? <laughs> At the end of that story, the guy who had the one talent went and buried it. And he said to the landowner that came back, he said, I buried it because I knew the kind of person that you were. And I was afraid. And I wanted to play it safe. And he says, you missed it. Again? Jesus is saying, man, you, us, don't miss me. He says, if you really knew me, then you would know this about me. Risk. Take that one thing that you have and risk with it. These parables are all about and leading us to this idea of relationship with God. Does God know you? Do you know God? And for those of us in this room who have been Christians for one year or 50 or 40 years, I don't care where we fall in that, this parable is a warning to us. Don't miss Jesus.
to be the bridesmaid that is wise, you need to understand that a wise person contains wisdom. And so you need to have wisdom about what it means to be a bridesmaid of God. And I know for the guys in here, maybe this is hard to work this metaphor. Bridesmaid, this is some Dennis Rodman mess, what is this? Bridesmaid. But you are the bridesmaid. But Jesus also used language to show us that we're also simultaneously the bride. You need to have this wisdom. You are the bridesmaid. You are the one that is waiting to take the father, the groom, to where the bride is. So you're in ministry preparing people to become brides. Because bridesmaids hang out in the room with the bride. And I mean, I'm talking about our culture today. Because, because our lives today are a little bit messier than this story. So today, bridesmaids hang out in rooms with brides, helping them get ready to meet their groom. And so part of our job to be wise is to be a bridesmaid, and we are working with kids and families, and we're working in communities, and we're teaching, and we're praying, we're intercessing, we're loving, we're walking with people, preparing them as the bride. But because we are the church, we also are a bride ourselves. We are simultaneously a bridesmaid and a bride at the same time. We are the church, and the church is called the bride bride in scripture. And so we are simultaneously a bride and a bridesmaid. We are a bride awaiting our groom, but yet we're the bridesmaid getting the bride ready for the groom. And you have to learn in health how to balance that, how to be the bride waiting for my groom to come, but also being the bridesmaid busy getting kids ready for the groom to come at the same time. How can you be kingdom ready, kingdom prepared, and kingdom active. A bridesmaid is to be kingdom active. A bride is to be kingdom ready. A bride is to be kingdom ready. A bridesmaid is to be kingdom active. You have to be kingdom ready and kingdom active at the same time. At any time, Jesus could come back. He could come back tonight, and I'm ready. I love my wife, but I'm ready. I love my kids, but I'm ready for my master to come. I have to prepare my children, yet be ready. I have to prepare my wife, yet be ready. Prepare my flock, yet be ready. Prepare actually ready at the same time. This is the wisdom that you contain. This is the power that you contain. This is the life that you are called to live. What does it mean to be kingdom active? Well, what I would do if I was you is I would read the whole chapter because when it gets to the end of it, it's talking about sheep being separated from goats and the sheep are those according to scripture. That when Jesus was hungry, they gave him something to eat. When thirsty, gave him something to drink. When a stranger invited him in. When naked, clothed him. When sick, visited him. When in prison, came to him. And the people say, what do you mean, Jesus? When did we do all of this? And he said, as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. This is kingdom activity, tending to the sick, inviting in kids that have been cast off as strangers in the land to, 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 to come about and see kids in the juvenile detention centers. We are to be bridesmaids to the culture, but yet be ready at the same time. I did a wedding not too long ago for a couple named Kenny and Keisha. Kenny and Keisha dealt with a lot of mess getting ready for their wedding. Should they jump over the broom? 
He was like, I don't want to jump on no, no broom because last time I was sweeping and a broom touched my foot and I went to jail that night. Brooms bring me bad luck, he said. And they argued back and forth. Do, do brooms bring good luck or do they send you to jail? And broom, and they, they was arguing. It was rough. And there was an age difference between the two. And so that was rough. And they were preparing for the wedding. And it was like rough, rocky roads. But I remember the day of the wedding. And it was a ghetto wedding. I mean, just real ghetto. I mean, the music was on a carry machine that's how ghetto it was I, it was ghetto but I'll never forget this I'll never forget when it was time for the bride Keisha to come down the aisle Kenny I, I, I didn't understand why he was doing this but he was talking I saw his mouth moving as she was coming down the aisle so I'm nosy I stepped a little closer to him to hear what he was saying and he was saying daddy's ready for you daddy is ready for you girl come on come on Daddy is ready for you. Daddy is ready. Come on. Daddy is, I've come here dressed for you, baby. And she's walking down the aisle. Ooh, I'm coming down the aisle. I've been waiting on this day. Thank you, Jesus. I've been waiting. Give me strength, Lord. Give me strength. I've been waiting. I've been waiting and waiting and whoo. He's there. She's there. Prepare. And even though they've been through the mess, all the mess has been worth it for this glorious moment. I know you're driving a rusty van. I know that you don't get paid much or anything. I know that you're wondering, should you jump the broom or does youth ministry bring you nothing but bad luck and headaches and heartaches? But if you endure through the activity of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, goes to this generation of young people one day the groom will crack the sky and you will send up praises you will send up hallelujahs you will raise your hand you will dance you will stomp your feet you will shout knowing that the van drives was worth it the pizza eating was worth it the tiredness was worth it the low pay was worth it because my groom has come and I'm ready and there's a generation of young people that are ready Ready for the groom? Can I get a witness in here? I, I'm on the edge here because I'm out of time, but I would be remiss if I didn't say this at least for 40 seconds. There's somebody in here that before we go off this stage, you need a prayer over you. You need your oil changed. You need to know the experience of the oil of the Holy Spirit. You need to know what it means to be a bride and a bridesmaid. If I'm talking to you, just stand up. If I'm talking to you, my God, you can't do another thing in this conference until we do this business right here. You, you, nothing in this conference would make sense until we do this. So I just pray this in Jesus' name. I pray release of the burden on your shoulder. You've been carrying youth ministry like a backpack on your back, and you are released in the name of Jesus from the pressure of being a youth worker. You are released from the pressure of writing sermons on your own, coming up with ideas on your own. God is saying, for the last year, for the last seven, Seven months for the last six years you've been trying to do ministry in your own power but today we ignite the oil on the inside of you that your light might shine that men might see that you would prepare a generation call them out of the darkness into the wonderful light that they might proclaim the excellencies of our Lord and Savior that they might be a holy nation a royal priesthood in Jesus name. Amen. God bless y'all.